Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, it is uh, seven o'clock my time, which I believe means we are ready to go. Uh, my name is Steve Pletcher. I'm a faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, I am actually not in the hospital at this moment, so I'm going to change my hospital background here. And let's put me in Marin, which is uh, where I live, and give a little better uh, picture of the area where we are here. So um, I just want to start by um, uh, thanking all everyone who's uh, on the line for participating. Um, I imagine it's uh, primarily residents and um, in many circumstances, uh, residents do much of the frontline care for our patients um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country. Um, and uh, I, I want to recognize all of, the, um, all of the hard work that you do, especially in these, um, in these difficult times and uh, encourage everyone to um, uh, stay safe and do the best we can to take care of our patients. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to talk about odontogenic disease in the sinuses. Um, I have no significant disclosures for this talk. Um, so we're going to use a case-based approach. Uh, we'll start with just a general review of odontogenic sinusitis, uh, talk a little bit about the differential diagnosis of a unilateral opacified maxillary sinus. Uh, we'll go through some treatment options, um, talk about some considerations related to hardware and implants, and then discuss a couple of uh, cases of non-inflammatory pathology of dental origin and, um, and talk about if there's a role for endoscopic surgery in that scenario. So here's case number one. This is a 38-year-old gentleman who was referred to me uh, by an otolaryngologist in, in Marin for consideration of balloon sinus dilation. Uh, the patient had four months of intermittent left-sided facial pressure and foul-smelling drainage um, and had been on two courses of antibiotics with only temporary improvement. He had uh, no dental pain or obvious uh, cavities on his exam. Um, and no history of recent dental procedures. His endoscopic exam showed some mucopurulence uh, from the left middle meatus, um, and he had a, we took a culture of that. The gram stain showed moderate gram-positive rods, um, and there were, uh, the cultures were described as numerous oronasal flora. So here's his uh, CT scan, and we can see very clearly that this is a patient with uh, unilateral maxillary um, opacification, uh, there's also some mild extension of inflammatory disease uh, into the um, infundibulum and anterior ethmoid region here. So let's talk a little bit about uh, dif differential diagnosis for this patient. And for anyone with a unilateral maxillary sin uh, sinus opacification, um, here's a list of uh, very common things we can see in this area. Uh, uh, mucus retention cyst, um, odontogenic uh, maxillary sinusitis, uh, fungus ball, sinonasal neoplasm, sin silent sinus syndrome, and some other type of uh, anatomic obstruction. So review, you're reviewing those a little bit. Uh, this is the typical appearance of a mucus retention cyst. While they can be quite large and opacify almost the entirety of the sinus, that's relatively rare. And usually you can see this uh, pretty typical kind of rounded um, appearance of the uh, edge of the cyst um, within the sinus. Um, uh, the, uh, um, and these lesions are, are really common. You'll see them in up to 30% of normal scans. Uh, pay no attention to the uh, encephalocele and skull base defect on the patient's other side here. Um, here's a patient with a mycetoma or a fungus ball. Um, again, we see involvement of a unilateral maxillary sinus. And there are a couple of features here that are common to see um, and, and very helpful in diagnosis and identification of a fungus ball uh, uh, at your initial evaluation. Um, so uh, one is this sort of speckled um, hyperdensity. Um, that you can see oftentimes within a fungus ball. Here you can see how it's brighter here, 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 and a little bit streaky. Um, when there is an air interface with this, uh, with the fungus ball, you will see it. Uh, you will see some irregularity frequently as these um, uh, these kind of clump, these clumps of fungus uh, are not um, uh, particularly smooth around the edges. Sometimes it can be a little bit more subtle. Here's a patient with a uh, fungus ball on the opposite side. Um, and here there is no obvious air interface, at least within the sinus. You get a little bit of a sense of some kind of irregularity here. Uh, and while there is some speckled hyperdensity, you can see it here, 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 it's, it's more subtle. So oftentimes you have to look closely, sometimes changing the windows, windowing of your studies uh, can help identify this lesion. Uh, here's a patient with a different problem. You can see this is a opacified right maxillary sinus. Um, when you look at the scan, you can also see that there's some extension of something between 
the inferior turbinate and the nasal septum here into the nasal cavity. It looks like it's coming out from the middle meatus area. Uh, another area that you can see closely when you look closely is this um, area of a little bit of um, uh, thickening of the bone, sort of more focal thickening of the bone uh, of the maxillary sinus right here. And here's our same patient on an axial view. Uh, and when we look again, we can see this uh, focal thickening and, and irregularity of the bone. Um, so this is a patient with an inverted papilloma. The soft tissue mass has come out into the nasal cavity uh, and close examination of the patient's scan will show you likely where the attachment site is along the lateral wall of the maxillary sinus, which was indeed where this tumor was attached. Here's another patient, uh, again, right-sided uh, maxillary sinusitis, um, but a couple of other features that, um, uh, that are uh, important to, to identify. Uh, one is if you look at the normal side here, you can see here's the uncinate process here, and look at the distance between the uncinate and the medial orbital wall. Whereas on the patient's right side, we can see the uncinate here. It's a little demineralized, so it's harder to make out, but you can see it really is right up against the orbit here without that same space or distance between the orbit and the uncinate. Other factors to look at, if you look at the contour of the orbit, here's the patient's normal side here, the normal kind of round appearance, and then uh, flattening out a little bit along the orbital floor. On the right side, you can see that it's elongated to the point where it comes down further inferior and changes the shape the, uh, of, the, of the maxillary sinus superiorly. And additionally, you can see there's a demineralization of the bone of the orbit that already thin lamina papyricea um, is now really not even visible as bone in this area right here. And with that, there's an overall expansion of the orbit too. So this uh, combination of findings, the um, opacification of the maxillary sinus, the lateralization of the uncinate, um, the expansion of the orbit, and demineralization of the bone of the orbit, those are all characteristics for silent sinus syndrome. Um, they also place these patients at potential risk for orbital injury during surgery. And some of the cases that you may see over the years for patients who have had orbital injury um, with endoscopic sinus surgery uh, were patients who had unrecognized silent sinus syndrome uh, at the uh, when, when the surgeon began the case, um, and they didn't take the appropriate care for removing the uncinate process, given its close proximity to the orbit that, did, that didn't have the normal bony protection between the orbit, uh, or, uh, separating them from the contents of the orbit, as well as the contents of the orbit extending further inferior into the maxillary sinus. So a lot of factors that can set you up for an orbital injury in this, in this type of case. Uh, in general, um, it's quite straightforward to do if you know what you're dealing with, but the real issue is identifying this uh, preoperatively if you're going to operate on these patients. And one good uh, way to, to approach that is to always look at the relationship between the uncinate and the orbit at the start of your surgery. Uh, here's a uh, photograph of that same patient, and it's a little hard to appreciate, uh, but you can see um, in the supraorbital region, uh, there's, uh, there's a significant crease on the side um, where, this, uh, uh, where the patient had uh, silent sinus syndrome. Um, there's, uh, the patient has significant enophthalmos as the volume of the orbit is expanded. The eyeball itself falls back uh, into the orbit, creating the, the, the enophthalmos. Oftentimes, patients will have some inferior displacement of the globe as well. And in more severe cases, they may even have double vision. So getting back to our original case, um, the uh, diagnosis for this case is also present on their CT scan. And it's right down here. Uh, you can see a tooth root right here, and you see the erosion of the bone between the tooth root and the maxillary sinus, um, this periapical lucency in continuity with, uh, with the opacified maxillary sinus. This is a patient with um, odontogenic sinusitis. Now, uh, one of the important things about this is you cannot rely on your radiologist to identify this for you. So here's a copy of the scan was done uh, outside of our institution. Here's a copy of the report. And if you look right here, it says there's no evidence of osseous erosion or cortical, cortical disruption or thickening. Um, so uh, the radiologist did not pick up this finding, nor did they uh, mention any potential odontogenic etiology for this patient. Um, that is uh, certainly not, uh, that's, a, that's a common finding overall, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But looking, uh, looking back a little bit um, at some papers, looking, uh, looking at the clinical aspects of, of odontogenic maxillary sinusitis, uh, so this is a relatively small case series. Um, the other sort of myths about odontogenic sinusitis is that they have dental pain. 
It's true for some patients, but only about a third in this study. And, you, and most studies describe uh, certainly well under 50% of patients have dental pain. So while it's reasonable to ask about that, it's, uh, you should definitely not use that, the absence of that symptom to rule out odontogenic sinusitis. A more common symptom, although it's still um, in the 50% range, is foul smelling drainage. Um, this is uh, uh, what, our, what our patient presented with and what I see probably the majority of patients who I see with odontogenic sinusitis present with this um, symptom to me. Um, and in this paper, they found that the CT scan was diagnostic in all patients, but when they looked at the, at the uh, radiologist comments, here you can see initial radiologist comment right here, only a third of these cases were identified by the radiologist. So anytime you see a patient with a unilateral maxillary opacification, um, certainly looking extremely closely at the patient's uh, dentition um, and, how, and really what you wanna look for is the bone around the tooth roots uh, to ensure um, that it is nice and tight around the tooth roots so you don't see that periapical lucency. Um, and um, if you do, you really wanna be suspicious of an odontogenic origin for these patients. Uh, this uh, disease process, um, can also extend up to involve the anterior ethmoid sinuses and even the frontal sinus, as, all, as the maxillary anterior ethmoid and frontal sinuses all drain through the middle meatus region. Sometimes the mucopurulence from the odontogenic sinus disease will cause inflammation in this area, and then it's really a, a plumbing problem and subsequent spread of infection um, into the anterior ethmoids and frontal. Um, the other thing that's common is I'll see a patient and I'll be suspicious of odontogenic sinusitis, and I'll talk with them and they'll say, oh, no, uh, that's not my problem. I just had a, I just saw my dentist and just saw an X-ray. Um, well, that's uh, that that may be true, um, but X-rays are not adequate to identify this problem as well. Again, here's that same case series and um, uh, a number of patients that had uh, X-rays prior to evaluation, but only one of the seven of patients with confirmed odontogenic sinusitis had an abnormality on their on their dental X-ray. So, really, not a good screening evaluation for this scenario. Uh, here's another study that's looked at 33 cases of odontogenic sinusitis. This was combined with an otolaryngologist and an oral maxillofacial surgeon. Uh, they looked at CT findings, or they, they uh, noticed significant CT findings in 64% of their patients. Again, uh, periapical abscess uh, being the most common. Um, they did use some endodontic techniques, which they felt were able to identify uh, more cases than just seen by the CT scan. Um, and again, the dental pain uh, here was uh, approaching 40%. Um, but uh, still, the, uh, the vast majority of patients did not have dental pain in their series. Um, and again, here are their, uh, both their, uh, their findings and identified by the radiologist initially. Their radiologist did identify um, about half of the patients with periapical abscesses on CT scan um, uh, and missed the other area, missed the other CT findings that were suggestive of disease um, in these patients. Uh, so again, critical to look at your own scans and anyone with a unilateral maxillary opacification or really one-sided anterior sinus disease, uh, you really want to be very suspicious of odontogenic sinusitis. Okay, how about treating these patients? This is a study that um, looked at, uh, started with 55 patients. This was a retrospective study. And this, the bottom line for this is that the treatment is fairly all over the board. So sometimes they just had sinus surgery. Sometimes they had sinus surgery and dental surgery. Sometimes they had dental surgery alone. Uh, sometimes uh, sinus surgery after failing dental surgery, some with medical management alone. Um, here's another study that looked at uh, 43 patients. Um, again, they found uh, the, the typical symptoms, uh, discolored drainage, facial pressure, uh, foul taste being the most common. Notice again that dental pain is not one of the most common symptoms. Um, recent dental procedure was identified in 50% of patients. Uh, so this is an important question to ask in the patient's history. Um, and the, the other thing that I think is probably the most important part of this is they identified uh, factors which predicted the need for sinus surgery. So if the OMC was obstructed or if there was complete opacification of the maxillary sinus, um, if they had prior dental procedure or hardware, um, or if they had a fistula. And what they defined as a fistula is simply a complete erosion of, the, of a portion of the bone um, between the um, uh, tooth root and the maxillary sinus. Um, so in general for odontogenic sinusitis, a CT scan is the most helpful evaluation and diagnosis. Um, you want to suspect that any patient with unilateral maxillary disease, and you cannot rely on your radiologist to identify this for you. Um, tooth pain and foul smell, particularly tooth pain, are present only in a minority of cases. 
Um, and a team approach is helpful uh, depending on the extent of disease overall. Um, and frequently in, for patients, in patients with more advanced disease, endoscopic surgery uh, can be required for their uh, successful management. So another question that's been identified in the, in the literature is, some, is, is there an increasing incidence of this disorder? Uh, historically, there are about 10 to 12% of maxillary sinusitis cases were identified as odontogenic sinusitis, although more recently, um, about 25% of non-polypoid maxillary sinusitis um, have, been have been identified as um, coming from the teeth. Uh, there have been a several um, uh, suspected um, rationales for this. Uh, people have uh, perhaps were better at identifying um, uh, odontogenic sinusitis than we used to be. Um, there's also a suggestion, this is from uh, Alex Chu's group back when he was um, at the University of Arizona, that uh, methamphetamine use leads to uh, worse dentition, which then predisposes these patients to developing um, uh, odontogenic sinusitis. So for those of you who are fans of uh, Breaking Bad, um, perhaps uh, the, uh, the blue crystals here are one of the, are one of the uh, drivers of the increased um, incidence that we're seeing uh, these days. And this is a cover from the a Journal of the American Dental Association. And again, rec the recognition that methamphetamines um, can lead to uh, significant um, dental disease, which can impact the sinuses as well. Now, I think it's sort of an interesting side note, but probably not the primary driver for what, for the uh, likely increased incidence uh, that we're seeing in this disorder. I think the true um, uh, etiology for this increase um, is the increased use of uh, dental implants. Um, so uh, here's a study that looks at, uh, that looks at a, a group of uh, patients with odontogenic sinusitis. Um, this is from an oral surgery practice, and they found that 55% of odontogenic sinusitis was due to iatrogenic etiology. Um, there were uh, issues related to dental extraction, uh, foreign body, sometimes when patients are having root canal, some of the material that's used for the root canal can inadvertently be placed in the sinus as well. Um, dental implants um, can be a major factor. And then there's also a procedure that you may have uh, heard of that's associated with dental implants called the sinus lift procedure. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in order to put an implant in place, you have to have an adequate bone stock. Uh, for patients who have a, uh, a fully aerated sinus, or as in this uh, diagram noted to be an expanded sinus, you can see how thin the bone can be um, along the inferior aspect of the sinus. And particularly, after if patients lose teeth, just like in the mandible, if you lose teeth in the maxilla, the bone stock tends to thin over time as well and become um, a less acceptable um, uh, uh, spot to receive a dental implant. Um, so uh, in order to create an implant in those, uh, in those patients, um, the sinus lift procedure has been described. So this is done transorally. A little window is made um, into the uh, inferior aspect of the maxillary sinus. Uh, the goal is to stay below the sinus mucosa here and create a pocket. Um, usually this can, be, this can be a bone graft, but usually a bone substitute material um, is used in this area. Uh, the patients are then given time to heal to uh, recreate this thicker bone stock, and then an implant is placed um, at, in a staged fashion. Uh, so this is the, the way the sinus procedure, sinus lift procedure is supposed to work. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always go as smoothly as described here. So here's another case. Uh, this was a 44-year-old woman who came to me with left-sided facial discomfort and nasal drainage. Uh, she had an abscessed tooth, uh, which, was in, was, which was extracted about a year ago, um, and then subsequently underwent a sinus lift and an, and an implant was placed by an oral surgeon uh, several months ago. Um, immediately after the procedure, the patient developed left-sided facial swelling, uh, was treated with antibiotics, which helped with the facial swelling and improved the pain as well. Um, but uh, since that time has had intermittent uh, facial pain and antibiotic treatment um, that was uh, uh, required to um, get back to her baseline, um, but uh, continues to have pressure and discomfort in that area. Uh, she had a, uh, she also had, uh, so her pain and swelling, um, uh, uh, her foul and drainage persisted, although the pain and swelling got better with some, with the antibiotics. And, and again, um, despite another course of antibiotics, her symptoms persisted. So she'd had a CT scan uh, before coming to see me. Um, and again, she has the obvious findings of the left-sided um, complete maxillary opacification, uh, significantly more ethmoid involvement. Um, and we'll see on some other scans that, this, that she had um, uh, anterior ethmoid disease 
uh, as well as frontal disease, um, but relative sparing of the posterior ethmoid. So all very consistent with a process that causes inflammation of the middle meatus area. Um, this scan was uh, done outside um, and they, um, or they ordered contrast, which is a little unusual in the, in the absence of a suspicion for a complication of sinusitis. But one of the things that's interesting here that you can see is you can actually see the outline of the mucosa of the sinus here. So this is all swollen mucosa. You can see sort of the line of contrast right at the edge of the mucosa and then the uh, mucoperulence that's filling the sinus. As we look here, you can see the patient's implant um, right here. Uh, we can see the kind of normal bone. This is some of the um, uh, bone substitute that was placed as part of her prior sinus lift procedure. And you can see a little bit of that there, but probably there's either been loss or erosion or um, a, a limited amount, certainly there's uh, at the uh, tip of this implant, and you can see that that is now in continuity um, with this patient's infectious process. Um, here she is on her, uh, on a sagittal image. Uh, again, two implants here. You can see the difference kind of density and appearance of the bone graft uh, material here with the implants kind of sitting a little bit on, uh, on both sides of that. Um, we can see a little bit of involvement of her frontal sinus um, up in this area as well. So now we're in a little bit more complicated situation. We've got this chronic perilent infection. Uh, patient has a uh, foreign body um, in, in the, in the uh, case of her implants, but also this sort of compromised um, dead tissue or tissue substitute uh, from the uh, attempted prior uh, bone graft. So what's, the, um, what's our uh, appropriate treatment for this? Um, there are a few different options. We could put her on IV antibiotics and hope that that resolves things. Uh, we could just do some endoscopic sinus surgery um, and decide the extent for that. Um, and, or we could do sinus surgery in combination with uh, hardware and graft removal. Um, and this would likely re require a uh, transoral approach as well. So we discussed these issues with her. Um, one of the kind of complicating factors for this is for many patients, the um, uh, the uh, procedures of going through the sinus lift as well as the dental implants um, require a lot of uh, 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 the patients have invested uh, both time, effort, and um, uh, discomfort from the procedures, as well as uh, significant financial um, outlays to uh, have implants placed. And so they, uh, and many of the patients who I've seen in the circumstances are really hopeful to keep their implants, whatever can be done. So for her, we just proceeded with, um, uh, with endoscopic sinus surgery. We treated with it, her with antibiotics around the time of her surgery. And so this is her, a uh, couple of videos from her. This is her three weeks uh, postoperatively, we're using a flexible scope uh, to go in through the left side of her nose so we can um, evaluate a little more thoroughly her, her maxillary sinus. So this is the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and here we're going to flex the wall. This is looking laterally. That was the infraorbital canal. And we can look inferiorly now here in the sinus that we've opened widely. You can see the bone substitute material, um, and you can see how the mucosa has uh, generally healed quite well over that area, doesn't have any of that of the uh, mucoperulence and has resolution of the uh, inflammation from before. Um, here's again just another sort of sequence uh, from uh, or another video uh, from about uh, six months after the surgery. Um, almost always for these odontogenic sinusitis patients, the mucosa looks really markedly inflamed and has this kind of beefy red um, appearance to it at the time of surgery, and they tend to normalize quite well after surgery. So she had this uh, result that despite a foreign body, despite the um, compromised tissue from her prior bone graft, uh, she was able to heal this. Uh, simply with uh, uh, a standard endoscopic sinus uh, procedure, flushing the sinus out uh, thoroughly at the time of surgery and giving her time to heal. Um, so we had a, a several, uh, several cases similar to this that we um, wrote up uh, a few years ago um, describing the surgical treatment um, for the scenario after a sinus, for, of odontogenic sinusitis after a sinus lift procedure. Uh, the bottom line is that we're often able to salvage hardware uh, with endoscopic sinus surgery alone. Um, so that more aggressive approach of uh, going in um, and removing hardware, removing the bone graft um, because of the sort of concern for long-term infection um, at an initial phase uh, is something that is probably overly aggressive in these patients. Uh, here's another patient. This was just sort of an interesting scan. Uh, I'm not sure how the oral surgeons were able to get the bone graft all the way over along the medial wall and to, and to survive here. Um, and then you can see here's the implant going into the, after the sinus lift procedure. It kind of spans a little bit of the air 
aerated sinus space, but also um, hits the bone graft later on. Despite all of this, this sinus looks not too bad. And it's her other sinus that has, um, that's so pacified and where she's got an implant sticking in as well. Um, so uh, uh, our surgical plan for this patient was just to address the, the right side, flush this out and try to preserve her implants. Um, for insurance reasons, she was unable to be treated at our, uh, at our facility, but hopefully uh, recovered well with that approach. Um, this is a different kind of dental hardware. These are zygomatic implants. Um, and this uh, is relatively rarely used for dental restoration, but is one of the options that um, you may see for patients who uh, have either failed or were not candidates for some other reason for um, sinus lift procedures and standard implants. Um, you'll, often, you'll also see these uh, zygomatic implants occasionally um, used for patients uh, who uh, are undergoing reconstruction after, um, uh, after cancer surgeries. Um, or other ablative surgeries involving the maxilla. Um, so you can see here, uh, this patient has uh, uh, involvement uh, bilaterally. You, we really don't see any bone between the, and along the sort of uh, this kind of intralateral aspect of the sinus, and the implants appear to be in, um, in direct uh, continuity with that area. So this was a 59-year-old gentleman who underwent uh, placement of these bilateral Im implants uh, following failure of multiple palatal implants uh, several years ago. Um, at the time of his uh, of placement of these, he had bilateral facial abscesses. Um, one was treated with an uh, incision and drainage through his uh, cheek area. The other one spontaneously drained through the cheek. Um, and then he had persistent foul-smelling nasal drainage. Um, again, here's his, uh, uh, here's his CT scan uh, when he came to see me. And this uh, is a clinical picture of him. Here's his, in his right cheek area. This is the spot where one of those uh, where he had spontaneously drained an abscess um, at the time of implant placement. Uh, he'd also had um, a couple of episodes of, uh, of facial swelling and pain following that time that had resolved with antibiotics. This just shows that same kind of soft tissue defect um, and its proximity uh, to the uh, tip of the implant placement place that, that had been placed here. Um, so we brought him to the operating room. He, again, was very concerned about having implants uh, removed. Uh, so we just did uh, very wide maxillary antrostomies um, and ethmoidectomies. He had a lot of mucopurulence um, as well as some granulation tissue within the maxillary sinuses. Um, he did well initially, but on post-op day seven, came back to my clinic with left-sided facial swelling and discomfort. And here's his uh, CT scan from about that time. You can see the marked uh, swelling here. Because of the windowing, it's a little difficult to see, uh, but there's an, uh, a, a, a lower density abscess collection um, right here as well. So I think one of the potential risks of um, intervening in a patient like this is you can basically kind of stir up um, some, of the, um, uh, some of the infectious material um, in the maxillary sinus, and that can result in some seeding of the implants as well, which is what occurred with him. Uh, we took him back to the operating room for a sublabial approach to drain that, um, and he subsequently um, has done well. Um, of, uh, of interest, uh, we did consult the oral surgeons again when this happened. Um, and the question what to do about the implants, um, they were uh, relatively um, unenthusiastic uh, about, uh, about intervening. They even uh, sort of questioned whether this was implant related at all, which um, seems pretty clear cut in this patient to me at least, um, and basically said that they can take the imp implants out later in clinic if needed. This particular patient was uh, concerned enough about his implants that he did not want them removed, um, and fortunately he recovered well at this time. Um, here's an, uh, another patient with a similar story. Um, again, you can see the bilateral uh, zygomatic implants here. Uh, the complete opacification of the maxillary sinus is here. There's less um, uh, osteomyogenesis um, around the maxillary sinuses and less um, involvement of the, uh, of the ethmoids than in our prior, prior patient. Um, he had uh, surgery as well. And here again, we're using a flexible scope um, after his surgery to, uh, um, to kind of navigate around to get a good look in those areas. So here we're in the patient's uh, left side. There's the nasopharynx. We're um, uh, navigating our slope to get into the maxillary sinus, posterior wall. You can see there's some minimal swelling in a couple of spots here and some mild uh, inflammation of the, of the sinus mucosa, but overall markedly, removed, markedly improved. Um, and we can also flex around to actually see the implant as it um, goes through the, uh, the aerated space of the sinus uh, with some surrounding inflammation um, here in this area but certainly markedly improved to his, uh, compared to his preoperative state. 
Um, all of these uh, patients who we've been seeing, um, other than that, uh, that uh, uh, abscess complication of the, um, uh, of the zygomatic implant, I would sort of classify as chronic odontogenic infections, um, but acute odontogenic infections are also something um, that you will uh, likely see in practice and that have a very different uh, um, uh, time course and, uh, and symptom and complication profile. So here's, uh, here's another patient. This is a 47-year-old gentleman uh, who presented to the emergency room a week ago with dental pain. Uh, he was prescribed amoxicillin and pain medication, but his symptoms uh, worsened. Um, he developed some right-sided periorbital swelling and proptosis, as well as a headache. Um, uh, the sort of complicating factor from him is that he was blind in his left eye from a prior uh, gunshot wound. So this was really um, an emergent situation for him with threatened vision in his only seeing eye. Um, here is his uh, CT scan. You can see all the artifact from the bullet on his left side uh, here. Um, you can also see the marked uh, proptosis. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the globe here. Um, this is a cut a little bit higher up where we're above the globe now, and you can see these sort of multi-loculated uh, low-density areas with some air um, in that pocket as well. Um, here is a, uh, uh, a couple of images in the, uh, in the coronal plane. These are bone window images. Again, you can see the um, bullet in the left side. Um, you can see that the eye has been markedly displaced um, over here on the right side. And when we look at his teeth, uh, you can see this very obvious uh, periapical lucency uh, around his uh, molar on this side. Um, here's a, a sagittal image. Um, again, there's a little bit of artifact uh, from the from the contralateral bullet, but you can see this extending up um, into the uh, uh, into the frontal sinus and some involvement of the ethmoids. But I would say the most um, uh, the most important thing uh, to look at in this image um, is that um, uh, patients who have one complication, one infectious um, or uh, an infectious complications that spread out of the that spread out of the sinuses in one area. They really need to be evaluated in all areas very closely, and it's quite easy to miss the epidural um, abscess that this patient has right here. Fortunately, there are a couple of dots of error that give you a nice clue to that. Um, but for those of us who are generally focused on the um, on the sinuses um, and much less so in the intracranial cavity, um, you could see how easy it would be to miss um, this area, this collection of infection. Um, up here in his, um, intracranially, um, particularly if the, we weren't given the sort of clue of the, from the gas forming um, organism here. Uh, so culture results from this patient showed uh, moderate strep anginosis. Uh, so this is a major abscess forming, um, uh, forming group. And you can, from the anginosis uh, component, it has a proclivity for uh, vascular spread. Um, there are also uh, a bunch of uh, anaerobes uh, that were um, uh, that were involved as well as this Peptostreptococcus species. Um, here's, our, here's our patient here after surgery. Um, again, you can see the uh, maxillary sinus and ethmoid sinuses, and you can see how the, those areas really normalize quite well um, after surgery. Um, he actually, that patient, uh, he, he did quite well. Fortunately, he did not have any um, uh, visual compromise uh, long-term. Um, he did require intervention from our neurosurgeons for a burr hole drainage um, for his uh, epidural abscess as well. So we're going to switch a little bit from uh, inflammatory lesions and talk a little bit about some other um, odontogenic types of lesions. So here's another case. This is an 18-year-old who presented to me with a left maxillary mass. Um, he was being uh, considered for a septoplasty and some possible um, sinus procedures, and so it had, had a scan elsewhere that showed this area um, in the maxillary sinus. Now, parts of this look similar to a mucus retention cyst, this kind of rounded appearance um, and interface with the air of the sinus. Uh, but re what really makes it clear that that's not what we're dealing with is the uh, bone erosion um, uh, posteriorly and laterally um, with, this, uh, with this lesion. Um, he had an MRI scan, uh, which um, uh, this are, uh, these are some uh, T1 images um, and shows this relatively homogeneous lesion. <clears throat> you can see it extends uh, through the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus and appears to be quite well demarcated. Um, on his uh, coronal scan, 
we can also see the intimate relationship um, that it has uh, with his tooth here. So here he is um, in the operating room. Um, and uh, um, as we're looking into the maxillary sinus, you can see this um, very uh, um, obvious um, rounded cystic lesion uh, that's uh, sitting here in the maxillary sinus. Again, some of the other landmarks, we can see the inforbital canal there. Here, we're just using a curved grasper to, um, uh, to uh, take a piece out of this lesion and see what we see inside. And we see this kind of yellowish, whitish, uh, murky fluid um, that, um, uh, that uh, comes out from there and then has a little bit more of this kind of whitish debris um, within the sinus as well. So here we've, uh, uh, here we've opened the lesion very widely. You can see that's down towards the tooth root right here. You can see sort of the boundaries of where that has eroded uh, the floor of the sinus there. And as we had uh, suspected in this patient, um, his uh, pathology came back as a, um, as a keratocystic odontogenic tumor at the time. Here he is in the clinic postoperatively. Again, we can see into the maxillary sinus and we can see sort of the outline of where that cyst was. Um, and he's healing quite well. He's collected a little bit of debris in there that will continue to flush and suction for him. And then we're going to take a look in. Here he is uh, three months postoperatively um, as we're uh, evaluating that, um, that area again. And as we slide in, again, here we're using a flexible camera so that we can um, get a little better view of the, uh, that inferior most portion of the maxillary sinus. And he's a little, little narrow to get in there, but we're working our way. So again, here's the lateral wall, inferiorly is down here now, and you can see there's a little bit of polypoid material at this inferior most aspect. You can see the kind of the banding from his, the, uh, the scarring as he's healed from his prior surgery, um, but overall uh, the area appears uh, quite healthy and stable. So this is a patient with an odontogenic keratocyst. Um, the, uh, uh, these are also have been referred to as keratocystic odontogenic tumors or KCOT. Um, it was uh, what was formerly known as an odontogenic keratocyst was reclassified in 2003 by the World Health Organization as a benign tumor instead of as a cyst. Um, and that was based on the potential for aggressive infiltrative behavior. Uh, the recommended treatment options are enucleation, possible sclerotherapy, marsupialization, or on-block resection. Um, these are more common in the, uh, in the mandible than in the maxilla. Um, and oftentimes are treated with, um, uh, with marsupialization uh, for the mandible as well. The, the key or the challenge is to try to keep the, that marsupialized space open as the area heals uh, to prevent recurrence of the lesion. Um, for the maxilla in this patient and in many patients, that's much easier to do through the nose and sinuses um, than it is uh, through the oral cavity. So that's what we did in this circumstance. Now, um, the term keratocystic odontogenic tumor has been removed, and we can update our slide that in 2017, the World Health Organization met again and reclassified this. No longer are these benign tumors. These are now cysts again, um, and they are, uh, the term odontogenic keratocyst has again been adopted um, as, the, um, uh, as, the, as the preferred term for these lesions. So um, uh, the WHO made a few changes. Uh, I will refrain from any comments. Uh, the WHO is getting beat up enough these days. Um, here is our uh, two-year post-op CT scan. The um, uh, this was his uh, lesion beforehand, and you can see um, that he's healed quite nicely. He's got a little bit of soft tissue in there, um, but nothing that's expanding or eroding bone or causing other issues. Um, and here's our uh, final case. This is just a <clears throat> companion to, our, uh, to the case before. This is a 16-year-old. Uh, who presented with uh, recurrent facial pain, um, as well as some uh, 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 thick drainage from his uh, uh, nasal cavity on the right side. Um, so he underwent a CT scan um, uh, before coming to see us. And here is his scan with the relatively unusual finding of a tooth um, that is here, uh, that's been pushed uh, by this cystic lesion um, medially into the maxillary sinus um, and even uh, the tip almost coming into the nasal cavity here. So uh, we had some discussions with our oral surgery colleagues here. Uh, they also suspected a um, odontogenic keratocyst um, in this patient, um, and uh, uh, they noted that it would be uh, challenging for them to address this transorally to remove the tooth um, uh, uh, 
through that approach. Um, so we uh, opted for an endoscopic approach, which would also allow for a wider uh, marsupialization. And here is uh, some video from this surgery. So here we are on the right side. Uh, we've taken down the unsinate and opened our, uh, started the opening of our maxillary sinus here. You actually see the tip of the tooth right there. We'll get a little better view of that as we expand our maxillary antrostomy inferiorly. You can see some of the surrounding mucopurulence here. And as we continue to push that, um, uh, that maxillary antrostomy inferiorly, we can connect it up with a small accessory ostium here, which is where that um, the tip of that tooth was actually sticking into the nasal, nasal cavity just a little bit. Here we're feeling it just to see how kind of solidly it's attached and it's fairly solid. We can suction out the mucopurulence around there and see this, uh, um, this lesion right here. Here we've taken sort of the bony cap off of that. You can see we've already tried to, we've already broken a little bit of the tooth root as we grabbed it and tried to pull it out. This was uh, sometimes the hard part is um, actually getting it out through the nasal cavity where things are a little, uh, a little tighter than, um, uh, than in the sinus itself but we managed to, to wriggle it through there. Sometimes you can push things out through the uh, nasopharynx if needed as well. Um, and for uh, those of us who aren't dealing with teeth all the time, always good to know the size of a molar here. Turns out it's just about exactly two centimeters. So there was, that's, that was my first uh, transnasal dental extraction. Um, I've had a couple others with less well-formed uh, teeth from similar lesions um, over the years, uh, but uh, um, not the main portion of my practice these days. So with that, I'll end with a few conclusions and, uh, and some time for questions. Um, so odontogenic lesions uh, are often in close proximity to the maxillary sinus. Um, infectious and inflammatory pathology of dental origin um, may spread to involve the sinuses. Um, and the sinuses oftentimes provide a, a, a nice route uh, to biopsy or treat odontogenic masses or lesions. Um, so thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, uh, happy to go through any questions. All right, silence. Okay, here we go. Can you performing endoscopic sinus surgery to, uh, for completely asymptomatic odontogenic sinus disease to avoid complications? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think uh, it is, um, there, there, there definitely can be a role. You know, you can imagine the, the less common scenario where someone is soon to be immunocompromised or perhaps is immunocompromised for some other reason and you're trying to, uh, to ensure that, um, that, uh, that they don't develop problems from this. Um, over time, um, usually the um, uh, usually their uh, intermittent fullness um, and that when patients sort of see the their CT scan with uh, with significant opacification of their of their sinus, oftentimes they're interested in having something done. Um, for patients with less severe disease, both symptomatically and radiographically, those are the patients who. Usually I involve, I have their, their dentists or oral surgeons will take um, kind of primary um, management responsibilities for them uh, rather than sinus surgery. So those are patients who are more likely to end up uh, with a root canal um, and uh, potentially a, um, uh, and, uh, combined with antibiotic uh, treatment with the goal of avoiding progression of their um, odontogenic disease to a state that it does create symptoms or potential complications for them. The, the kind of major complications that we saw, um, like that, the patients who uh, had the orbital and intracranial abscess, those, uh, those types of complications are actually quite rare with the patients with chronic disease. Um, but uh, given the, um, the type of bacteria that we see in our acute odontogenic sinus disease patients, um, that it's quite common for them, or it's one of the common presentations uh, for them to be at risk uh, for uh, for infectious complications that spread um, to the orbit or intracranially. Um, and oftentimes, uh, uh, kids are another category um, who you can see this, uh, this type of 
um, really rapid infectious spread. These patients oftentimes um, uh, take a little while with antibiotic treatments to improve and sometimes um, can require multiple drainages of, uh, of some of their soft tissue abscesses. Okay, I think, unless there are any other questions or comments, um, I think we will uh, close it down a few minutes early, give everyone a little break. Um, I, think, I believe there's one more, uh, one talk scheduled after me. So um, once again, uh, pleasure participating. Um, stay safe, everyone, be well, and um, we'll uh, continue to work through this together. Thanks. Thank you very much, appreciate it.